Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming to, to share the, the afternoon with me. Uh, many things happen to people in, in life. And I was particularly impressed very recently, if you, if you follow Twitter, one of the things I follow is called inspirational quotes. And they actually attribute to John Lennon, having said, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. And it makes you sort of reflect back and say, well, you know, what has happened in my life and what plans had I made about it or not? If I give you a, a brief sort of history, I was, I'm old enough to have been one of those who had to go through the 11 plus system and then made it into, into, into the grammar school. And I remember there at times, sort of teachers used to give you, oh, this weekend's homework, write an essay, you know, my ambition, my, my future is going to be and so on. And of course, in my, in my year group, we had those who were the, the bright spark academics, you know, those that ended up having doctors, doctorates and, and so on. And then those of us who, what we call in, you know, in sporting terms, like, like when you watch a bicycle race, the, the, the peloton, no? you, you just about survive by going along with the others. And we had to sit down and scratch our brains and, and invent during the weekend, you know, what should I write about? Those who were more sporting wrote about being a, a famous footballer. Those who were more into acting wrote about being a Hollywood actor and so on. Uh, and those of us like me, just you know, whatever was the mood of, of the day, and if you saw something on television, that perhaps inspired your, your life story. So you could say that during my teenage years, I, I had no, no fixed plans, no, nowhere really to go. You, you survived on a day-to-day -day basis. You were, it's true, in a, in a carefree world, and you, you finished your education system. Scholarships were hard to come by every now and then, so the high flyers aimed to go to university, and those of us who were in the peloton just aimed to, to get some sort of decent job. And that led to my, to my first job, who was actually as a clerical officer within the civil service. You open yourself up now to a completely new world, an adult world, you know, people working, you come into closer contact with those who are no longer just your, your age group, but higher. And there I got a, a first influence. I got encouraged and enthusiastic about, about joining up in, in the army, yeah. uh, a service to, to the queen, a service to, to your country. A few of my colleagues within the civil service had become members of the volunteer reserve in the Gibraltar regiment, and they said, oh, come on, you're now, you're now of age, uh, you've missed out, conscription has been over and done, and done with, come and join us. And, and that led me to joining uh, the TA part of the, of the Gibraltar regiment. Extremely enjoyable, even led me to becoming a, a full-time soldier there. And it was during, during that time that you open yourself to, up to other experiences in the world, you open, your, you become an adult, you're legally over the age of, of 21, it was considered at the time, and you, you come to en understand and empathize more with people's problems. You, you end up, if you're kind-hearted, you end up wanting to help people. Uh, and although I had never been sort of ultra-religious, I had always had, you know, that basic belief, went along again with the, with the peloton in a way my, my religious life led. Uh, and by, by sort of casual talks and eventual development, I ended up being, being encouraged and by many others, including one of the majors I had within the regiment, who said, you know, you, you would become quite, quite a good priest. You would be a, a, a good clergyman if you went up. So, so I decided, you know, it was a time in phase in life. You wanted something new, uh, big responsibility, but, but I, I was willing to go along. And what happened was there were already other Gibraltarians studying and so on. So the late Bishop Rapallo at the time actually asked, well, you know, am I entitled to some sort of uh, scholarship or whatever from him? And he, he wrote off to, to Rome and see whether he could crown some money from them. And they said, look, rather than giving you cash, we're willing to, to offer you a, a place for your student uh, in a college here. Gibraltar at the time, for political reasons, kept away from, they didn't classify us with either England or Spain. And they put us in under the sacred congregation for uh, evangelization of the peoples, mainly missionary countries and ex-communist countries and so on. So I ended up, by accident rather than by design, actually being, have been the privilege, what was considered by many, the privilege of being uh, a student for the priesthood in, in Rome. Great experience, great culture, different language. I got there thinking, well, if you know some Spanish, you can get away with the Italian. Believe me, going to, to university lectures in Italian and at the pace that they speak, it's a different story. But you, 
you, you get through it. And you, you become, you either hate it or you love it. And I, I actually loved it. I, I fit it in quite well with the, with the lifestyle of there. One great advantage, you're from Gibraltar. You're considered to be neutral. You're neither those who hate the colonial powers have, have uh, pity for you. Oh, yeah, you've been one of those who've been colonized, yeah? uh, and so on. And because you are bilingual, being from Gibraltar, English and Spanish, you, you have a greater choice of friends and so on. And I became great friends with especially the, the Latin American uh, students and so on. And in Mexico, they always celebrate, I think it was the 12th of December, they celebrate, you know, the Lavin here in the Guadalupe, and they, they took me to one of the big dues and so on there. And their guest of honor on that evening was this very small, petite, insignificant looking lady known to everyone as, as Mother Teresa. And the impression that that lady caused on you within the first five seconds of seeing her is unforgettable. People talk nowadays, who's the greatest, you know, who would you like to meet and so on. Having met her, I don't think there's anybody else they would like to meet. Yes, of course, you live there in Rome. Yes, of course, I've met the Pope. I have, have served, I've served with him in, in Masters in St. Peter's Basilica. But this lady radiated humility, the way, the, way, the way she spoke, the way she humbly told you, reversed everything, you know, in respect of poverty and so on, and ended up saying, yeah, well, and what are you doing about it? You know, you're sat there comfortable. We, we were having a meal uh, after the, the evening. They had their folklore songs and so on. Uh, and to each and every one, she spoke to as if you were the most important thing in the world, but gave you that message. And what are you going to do personally? What's, what's going to be your thing? So I'm, I'm eternally grateful to, to Mother Teresa for, for the way she, she encouraged me and still keeps on encouraging me in many, many things in, in life. I've been asked, you know, well, what's it like to live there within the, the Vatican area and so on? Look, what you see on television is not, <laughs> is not really what happens in everyday life, you know. In television, every time they put things on, they put all these cardinals, everyone walking, dressed, dressed, to, you know, uh, uh, full regalia, all in red and so on. Those are just ceremonial clothes, you know, the same way as, as the army uses its, its ceremonial clothing for, for parades. In many ways, it's very simple, ordinary, everyday life. Yes, it does have advantages, self-contained things. There's, uh, there are medical clinics inside, there's, there's, there's pharmacies, there's shops and so on. Tax-free, but if you come from Gibraltar, that doesn't really sort of mean a lot. You know, they, they don't add uh, the vats and so on there. Yeah. And like in everything in life, you have a big handful of very, very decent people, God-loving, human, human, humanitarian type of people. And you have those, you know, who think, well, they're here because they probably have, have nothing better to do. And what should have happened to me from Rome? That is something, again, that I felt by divine providence. I ended up doing the things I did. In Bishop Rapallo was the Bishop of Gibraltar at, at the time, and he came over. He had to come to Rome to, to do his, his visit to the Pope and so on, and I accompanied him. And by the time it was all over, he had been sort of requested to him by, by one of my tutors there. Would he mind if I, if I stayed behind in Rome and, and did the doctorate? And from what I gather, this man was sort of hinting that I could eventually take over from him uh, as one of, one of the teachers of, of church history and so on. So I said, look, I'm not going to object to anything. Part of me wants to, to go back and work within a, a pastoral atmosphere in a, in, in a parish. And part of me likes, likes the lifestyle here, likes the, you know, the Roman way of life. Like I said, you either fit into it or you or you, or you simply hate it. But unfortunately, Bishop Rapallo died in, in very early 84, uh, and I came back to, to Gibraltar for that funeral. And when, when I got back, I was told by, by the rector of the cemetery, at the seminary where I was, he said, look, he said, were you aware that whilst you traveled away, a letter has arrived to me, dated a day or two before Bishop Rapallo died, he said, requesting that, that, you, be, that you be ordained a, a deacon now, uh, because he wants to sort of expedite you, and it seems he's going to, to shy away you staying behind in Rome for a while. One, one accepts that, so in the, in the summer of 84, you get ordained to the diaconate. I had to return back, back to Rome. I still had one more year to go to complete. Now, this time I was, I was doing a, a licentiate in philosophy, so I wanted to, to complete that. Uh, and within that time there, because you, you by now, at this stage, you're in your fifth year of studies, you're, you're one of the senior students there, and so on, 
we were attending uh, at the university uh, an assembly, a meeting, you know, a hall full of people similar, similar to this. And the time came to elect the, the president of the, of the students' uh, union for there. And no one, like typical, no one wants to volunteer for anything. And I always remember a good friend of mine, Luciano, an Italian who was sat here on, on my right, you know, uh, the, the president of the assembly said, look, we had to decide now, we're going to come back again this afternoon. And if you're Italian and you love your siesta, the last thing you want to do is go back in the afternoon. So, so the Italian stood up, he said, oh, I propose Edwin here. He's got the advantage. He's, he's not only now bilingual, he's now trilingual. He can cope with Italian, with the Spanish, with the English. Yeah? And you get one of these sort of uh, unanimous uh, acclamations around the hall. No one wanted to waste any more time in deciding. And I ended up being elected as the president of the, of the students' union. Nothing had been further from my mind before. Uh, so perhaps that was the first step of becoming a, an elected representative of a set of people. Yes, there were hardships. Yes, you know, there were cases you had to deal with, some sad, some difficult. But at the end, at the, end of the day, it gave you a satisfaction. It gave you, you know, a sense of, of achievement. I've done my part. I've done my contribution. So once I left Rome in, in, in 85, I thought I was coming back to, to a quiet life in Gibraltar. And once you've, you've got the the bug, the buzz of, of doing things for people, you end up you know, getting involved in other activities. I, I got involved because of pastorally families I had to help with who were suffering, drug addictions and, and so on. And, and I just offered my, my services and so on. My support above all is what I offered people who started what today is known as, as, as Bruce's Farm. Yeah, so you end up doing things in life because life happens while you're busy. Making, making other plans, yeah, and it got to a stage, unfortunately, where and there's always two sides to every story. I felt I wasn't delivering as a priest, perhaps what, what the congregation wanted. I had my, my own ideas, some were ultra-modern, some perhaps were ultra-conservative, so, so I decided to best to take some sort of leave of absence from that, which I did in the, in the summer of 89. I moved away from St. Teresa's Church, uh, by, by that time, the following year, I decided to formalize my qualifications and went off to, to Christchurch College in Canterbury to do a, the postgraduate certificate in education. And you end up getting involved in an educational world where, again, because a friend of mine from the teaching profession ended up being the president of the teachers' union, you know, you're a volunteer. Oh, I need someone to help me. Uh, no one wants to volunteer to be the treasurer. Uh, I'll help you because my husband's an accountant, but, you know, by nomen for nomenclature purposes. Let's have you on. And I got involved in the trade union world, again, in that respect. And from the trade union world, the teacher association was always seen as the, the safe middle of the line group. Uh, there was always, and I think still exists today, a rivalry between the, the then called Transport General Workers Union, the Clerical Association Union. So the teachers were the safe people down, down the middle. And you end up being pushed to become the chair of the, of the trades council. And that's when Jack Straw comes up with his infamous uh, joint summary proposals. That involves you getting mixed up in, in meetings with the then chief minister of the day. He invites you to form part of delegations to go off to, to Westminster to meet uh, Peter Hayne and, and so on, people you know, who best, best not say what one really thinks about them here. But you, know, you, you, get, you get carried away, you get involved. So, so what else can I say? Life happens. Yeah, once you're busy making plans, never crossed my mind to be a politician. You end up getting involved to an extent, if you're not one of those who likes to sit in an armchair and complain, but one of those who would rather get the bum off the seats and go out and do, and do something. Well, look, this is what I had to offer. I've stood for elections three times. I really, really enjoyed serving the people. No matter what political party you support, people are by nature genuine. They come, they thank you. And if I have just contributed one little drop into a pail of full, of full of water, that is what makes Gibraltar what we are. And that is what makes me even prouder today of being a Gibraltarian and of sharing this story with you. Thank you.